Hello again, everybody. Today, we're going to talk about a wonderful antitrust case that affects our lives very much today, and that's the case of the U.S. versus Microsoft, begun in 1999 and somewhat concluded in 2001. And in some ways, it harks back to the case that we uh, talked about earlier from 100 years before, which is the antitrust case of Standard Oil versus the U.S., in which Standard Oil was accused of taking its monopoly in one field and then bundling and tying together all sorts of other industries, not to hurt the consumer by raising prices, but to hurt the consumer by harming competition and preventing other people from getting into the business. In the case of Microsoft, by the end of the 1990s, Microsoft had a monopoly. It really had total dominance and the court found it had a monopoly on the desktop operating system, basically the Windows operating system, which ran on at least 95% of the personal computers people had. And it, they had gained that monopoly in ways that were fair and square. First of all, Bill Gates made a really smart deal with IBM early on in which IBM agreed to license his desktop operating system, the Microsoft operating system for the IBM personal computer, but gave Microsoft the right to license it to other people as well. And in a smart business move, Bill Gates, unlike Steve Jobs at Apple, licensed his operating system to any hardware maker, from Compaq to Dell to Hewlett Packard to IBM. So it became basically the standard operating system for any computer that used Intel chips. It was called Wintel, the Windows Intel Monopoly, and it was gained by really smart, good business deals. It also uh, was gained because he, as we discussed in the Apple versus Microsoft case, because Bill Gates uh, was able to beg, borrow, steal, and copy the graphical user interface that Apple had developed and turn it into something that was almost as good. Apple, of course, had begged, borrowed, and stolen it from Xerox Park. Uh, but uh, Apple had at least paid for the rights to do it. In the case of uh, Microsoft, it just pretty much replicated all the improvements that Apple made into a graphical user interface, the type of interfaces, interfaces we use that have trash cans and folders and icons, uh, that was almost as good as the Apple system. Now, getting a monopoly, if you get it fair and square, there's nothing against the law about that. You earned it. You did it by either good business dealings, as Gates did with IBM, or by creating a good product, or even beg, borrowing, and stealing in ways that were just on the verge of legality, the product. The question is whether you're doing something illegal to maintain the monopoly or to leverage the monopoly into another field when you want to dominate, if you're an oil refiner and you decide you want to dominate the uh, gas station business uh, and you try to tie and bundle things together so that your competitors in the adjacent business get you know, harmed or put out of business. And that tying or bundling to dominate a different field by using your monopoly to gain uh, control over competitors, that's where you run afoul of the great old Sherman Antitrust Act. And in the case of, uh, of Microsoft, it involved something called the browser. Now, believe it or not, we didn't really have the World Wide Web to surf around until the mid-1990s. Uh, up until then, if you wanted to go on the internet at large, it was kind of a messy place with all sorts of command lines and uh, different ways of sending and fetching information over the internet. But in the 1990s, Tim Berners-Lee at CERN and many other people developed that point and click way that we now surf the web. And in order to do it, you needed a browser. And one of the people who created a browser was the people who created Netscape. 
Now, this case was mainly, this Microsoft case, about Microsoft trying to put other browsers, especially Netscape, out of business. But by extension, it applied to everything, whether it was going to be search engines that Microsoft was going to put out of business or music players that they're going to put out of business. Now, the, uh, the original Netscape was done by a guy named Mark Andreessen. You know, I, when I was at Time Magazine, I put him on the cover as one of the golden geeks. There he was barefoot. And you see him sitting there um, between two very important Tulane players. The person on your right is Jim Clark, who went to night school at Tulane and ended up meeting Mark Andreessen there and deciding to create this browser that he had written as a student at the University of Illinois, Mark had, called Mosaic, to turn it into a commercial business called Netscape, where they would have a browser. And Jim Clark enlists one of his friends, and that's the other guy in the coat and tie on, your, on the left, your left of Mark Andreessen, and that's Jim Barksdale, somebody you'll probably meet, somebody also connected with his Tulane, his son, David, is on the board of Tulane. So together, they form a company. I remember them coming, pitching to us at Time Magazine. That's why I put Mark on the cover. But they also pitched to us, come in on Netscape. Time Magazine would be a great partner uh, because you could, uh, you know, put your content on the World Wide Web and help us sell the Netscape browser. Well, Microsoft didn't want that because if you do that, if, uh, if uh, Netscape's allowed to have a browser, that could disrupt uh, Microsoft's control over your user experience. Because after a while, you won't be just using the desktop operating system. Your browser, as it is in many places on your phone, even on your desktop sometimes, is the main operating system you use. So what Microsoft does is it creates its own browser called Internet Explorer. And what it does is it bundles it in to the Windows operating system. So if you're sitting there on your computer using a Microsoft operating system, you have bundled in without any extra money, free, this browser. And it's hard to uninstall it. It's there when you sense fact, even today, if you click on something in some Microsoft place, it might open uh, what is now the Internet Explorer browser because it's all tied in. They were tying it in. It's hard to uninstall, and they made it hard to install or use Netscape, the competing browser. And that was the core of the case. The case is brought partly at the instigation of Netscape. Our friend Jim Barksdale pushes the government to do it. But there in the picture, you see Janet Reno, the Attorney General of the United States, Joel Klein, the Assistant Attorney General for Antitrust, Richard Blumenthal, who's then the Attorney General of Connecticut, brings it on behalf of state Attorney Generals, just as Joel Klein and Janet Reno are bringing a federal case out of it. And they all hire the great lawyer, David Boyce, famous for many things, Bush v. Gore, gay marriage, uh, to be the lawyer who's going to handle this in front of the courts. And among the many things he does, and I hope you, you all <laughs> listen to it on the web, is he deposes Bill Gates for hours and hours, and they get into sparring matches about what does the word very mean, or what does it mean to say you requested something? I mean, Bill Gates will just not give an inch, and David Boyce keeps going toe-to-toe -to -toe with him. So it's very amusing, but it did not help Microsoft's case, because when the case goes to trial, uh, David Boyce at the courthouse there in Washington, D.C., is able to play that deposition and to cross-examine other people and really make Bill Gates look silly. I personally remember this very well. This is exactly at the time that Bill Clinton is being impeached as President of the United States. And I was editor of Time back then. So we moved uh, a lot of our staff down to Washington, D.C. 
from New York in order to cover the impeachment of the president. And one morning at the hotel, the Hay Adams, I go down into the lobby and I run into Joel Klein, who I know, and Ken Arletta, who's a journalist I know. And I say, are you all going to the um, impeachment hearings at Capitol Hill? And they said, no, we're going to the J. Barrett Petterman courthouse a few blocks away because David Boyce is going to be deposing. I mean, he's going to be cross-examining one of the Microsoft uh, geniuses, a guy named uh, a guy named uh, Mirvold, Nathan Mirvold, and he said that's going to be priceless. You got to come watch it. And so I played hooky from going to the impeachment of the president of the United States just to see David Boyce do this across examination, in which uh, Mirvold, having like Gates said, no, we did not try to tie the um, operating system. Uh, into the internet browser. Then uh, David Boyce would pull out a memo or an email and say, well, let me refresh your recommendation. It was like being in a Perry Mason episode. Now, the argument that Microsoft makes is that the Internet Explorer is free. It's bundled in. There's no harm to consumers. We're not charging anything for it. And there are two prongs uh, to the antitrust law. And one of them is if you harm consumers, if you start charging them too much money because you got a monopoly, that's a harm to consumer and that makes your monopoly illegal. Well, why, uh, if it benefits consumers and it harms competition, should that be bad as well? And the answer is yes. The other prong of antitrust law is simply that if you do something that might hurt your competitors in a field uh, in which you have a monopoly and you're trying to crush competition, even if your product's free or even if your product is price is not being raised, and that was true of Standard Oil, they weren't raising the price of oil, it was true of Microsoft, they weren't raising the price of the browser. But by crushing competition, it does many things. It makes our economy less strong. It makes the market less healthy. It means eventually higher prices may be charged. And it also means eventually new products, new innovations might not be created because competitors get crushed. Over the years, especially in the past 20 years, the notion of harm to competitors has receded. The courts have ignored that generally if there's been no harm to the price charged to consumers. But I think that's a bad idea. And so did the judge in the Microsoft trial. The judge in the Microsoft trial said that Microsoft maintained its monopoly power by anti-competitive means and attempted to monopolize the web browser market. And that was unlawful. It was an unlawful time to, uh, under the Annie Sherman uh, Trust Act. And you can see the very long, uh, long passage, but I think it's important from the judge in the case, uh, saying that most harmful of all is the message that Microsoft actions have conveyed to every enterprise with the potential to innovate in the computer industry. Through its conduct towards Netscape, IBM Compact, Intel, and others, Microsoft has demonstrated that will, it will use its prodigious market power and immense profits to harm any firm that insists on pursuing initiatives that could intensify competition. And as he concludes, he says, the ultimate result is that some innovations that would truly benefit consumers will never occur for the sole reason that they don't coincide with Microsoft's interests. So his point being that even if it's not costing consumers anything directly right away, it's costing us in the long run because people like yourself People like yourself who may be wanting to start a business, you might not be able to do it if you think, well, Microsoft will just crush me. And so it hurts people who want to start up their own enterprises and it stifles innovation. In the end, the appeals court, it gets very complicated. The appeals court uh, says we affirm in part, and reverse in part, the district court's judgment that the Sherman Antitrust Act was uh, violated, uh, 
And instead of it going back to trial and going on forever, Microsoft and the Department of Justice have a settlement. Their settlement is simply that uh, Microsoft's pro uh, application APIs, application programming interfaces, will be shared with third party companies. And there'll be a panel that for five years will have full access to Microsoft's source code. This allows new companies to do products that work on the Microsoft platform. And what new products come along? Well, like Google, for example. If Microsoft had been able to take its search engine and just embed it right into the operating system and to keep Google from having its APIs, its source code, its programming interfaces, you never would have a Google. You never would have a Facebook. You never would have an Amazon. Well, think about that. That really would have stifled innovation. The odd thing is now Google, Facebook, Amazon are accused of doing the same thing. They're accused of Google's case. If uh, somebody creates a great map, a great uh, way of using maps as a platform, Google just bundles maps in with its search engine, ties it to its search engine, and other map companies like MapQuest end up going out of business. Likewise, Facebook buys its competitors, Instagram and WhatsApp. Or if somebody's gonna do something like Snap does and it competes, Facebook tries to bundle in the same, uh, the, the same uh, products that Snap is creating, bundles it into Facebook. Likewise, Amazon. And they all say, where's the harm? Where's the foul? We're giving our stuff away for free. But it's kind of ironic because they wouldn't exist if people hadn't found the harm and the foul of the antitrust uh, type of activities, the anti-competitive activities that Microsoft was doing. So stay tuned, in the next four or five years, we're going to see antitrust cases, both in Europe, maybe at the state level, maybe even at the federal level against Google, Facebook, and Amazon. And we're gonna see replayed the same arguments that happened in US v. Microsoft. And actually, we're gonna see replayed some of the same arguments that were uh, made against uh, U.S. Uh, re standard oil. So history repeats itself, and that's why we study it.